Hello, we're about ready to get started. Uh, welcome everyone. On behalf of the USAID Bureau for Food Security, the AgriLinks team, Feed the Future, and the USAID Fall Armyworm Task Force, I would like to welcome you to the third and last webinar in our Fall Armyworm series. Uh, which will be focusing on pesticides and the challenges for safe and effective usage, especially for, for fall armyworm control in Africa. Uh, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I am uh, probably a voice you've heard before if you've joined an AgriLinks webinar. I am uh, your host and facilitator for the webinar today. Uh, before we get started with the content, I just wanted to provide a few reminders. First is that the chat box is your main way to communicate today. So please feel free to use it to introduce yourself, uh, to share any resources, and to ask any questions that you have throughout the presentation. We love your questions. Uh, there's no question that is too simple or too complex. Please do feel free to ask, and we'll be collecting those questions to ask after the main presentation today. I'd also like to point out that there are a few resources and links for you in the bottom left of your screen. You'll see some uh, file downloads, and uh, especially exciting is we now have the uh, Fall Armyworm IPM guide in French for you in the file downloads box, if, if that's uh, needed for you. And some other key links, including uh, links back to the first two webinars in this series, which we encourage you um, to take a look at. And we'll make sure that we share those uh, in the chat box as well. Uh, lastly, this webinar is being recorded, and we will post the recording on AgriLinks. Um, by virtue of attending today, you'll also get an email with links to the recordings from all three of the webinars in these series, if you'd like to share them with your colleagues or re-watch any of them. All right, so to give an introduction to our main speaker today and also to the topic at hand, I would like to introduce Brian Conklin, who is the Senior Ag Advisor for Fall Armyworm Team, for the Fall Armyworm Team, at the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'll pass the mic over to Brian. Great. Thanks, Julie. We want to welcome you back to our third of three webinars. We've done one each week, and the first one, of course, covered our IPM technology basket. The second webinar covered a number of tools we've developed, including our IPM guide, our pest management decision guide, and the launching of a new animation for farmers on scouting the fall armyworm. All of these resources are available to you, including uh, an opportunity to watch previous podcast uh, webinars on our AgriLinks website. So we encourage you to come back to the AgriLinks website. If you uh, Google the uh, fall armyworm tools, you'll find uh, the tool page for the fall armyworm. Uh, there's also links within this guide here. So we want to encourage you to come back and, and use those as a resource. Today's webinar focuses on managing risk to human health and the environment. When the fall armyworm was, was discovered on the African continent, the, the nat natural response from a number of governments was to flood farmers with pesticides. Um, today we're going to have a speaker who helps talk about the hazards and the, uh, the challenges of dangers of pesticides and dispel a number of myths that are out there, shared not just by farmers but by the rest of us as well. We're also going to look for ways to, to move from higher risk to lower risk together. And so, let me introduce our, new, our, our final speaker of this three-part series. Uh, Paul Jepson is a professor at University of, uh, Oregon State University. He is probably the leading expert for IPM and pest, uh, pesticides risk management. And it is a privilege to have Paul online with us today. And Paul, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Brian and uh, Julie, and uh, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody on the call. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, really, the purpose today is to highlight some things we're going to be doing that will inform you about uh, pesticides, hazards, and risks, such that in your various roles, you can support decisions that farmers make or advise and inform others or point individuals to information sources that they may not have been aware of. I think there's four take-home messages I want you to really consider um, in, while you're thinking about my presentation and as it's going along. First of all, we, we're not quite at the place yet where we can make what we might call recommendations about pesticides that are truly compatible with IPM goals. Those goals might be something, a pesticide that's efficacious, 
that actually works, that can be applied in a way that reaches the pest and is toxic to it. But also, there's a minimal risk of any toxicity to humans, including children and women that work in fields um, after treatment, um, as well as to the people that handle and apply the pesticides themselves. And then also with minimal to no risk so also to the environment, and that would include domesticated animals, goats, chickens, um, other organisms that are fed, provided with forage, and also that wander around the fields. Don't forget pollinators. Please don't forget natural enemies. And so we don't have sufficient information really yet, but we're moving in that direction. African farms are highly vulnerable to adverse impact. Vulnerability goes beyond our concept of normal risk. It all, you know, don't run across the road because there's a high risk you're going to be run over by a car. Well, if you're not aware that cars are potentially harmful in the first place, then the concept of not running across the road is a challenge. And in many cases, and in, uh, the, the awareness of pesticide toxicity is not as widely distributed as it should be. And I have to say that applies to American farmers that I work with, Central American farmers also, not just African farmers. But the vulnerability in Africa in terms of awareness of the risks, in addition to the uh, level of training and access to equipment and support that's required to use pesticides in a way that maximizes their benefits and minimizes their costs. So there's actually a higher risk of adverse pesticide impacts in Africa. And one of the scientific articles I'm going to make you aware of today highlights these. And I will talk about that a little bit later on. But the kind of good news at the end, in a sense, is that critical information needs can be met because I represent a group of scientists who basically said enough is enough. All of the information I'm going to share with you today is widely distributed in the pesticide industry, in regulatory agencies, and in research and support agencies and nonprofit organizations. It just doesn't happen to be placed in the domain of farmers who need this information to make decisions. So I'm part of a movement of, we hope, high integrity scientists who are trying to correct this ill in the system such that better decisions can be made and that you are not intimidated by the idea that pesticide uh, toxicity is an overriding factor that cannot be managed in any way. When we looked at the profiles of uh, pesticides um, for fall armyworm, and this information is in the USAID and CIMIT published fall armyworm manual in chapter three that I was the lead author for, <clears throat> eight of those pesticides which are widely used are highly hazardous. These are pesticides that are acutely toxic. They can result in a lethal outcome if you have a spill or you're exposed to a, a, a small amount of them. They also have chronic risks associated with them in many cases. They can cause cancer. Uh, if uh, you're a pregnant woman, birth defects or other chronic degenerative conditions can result from being exposed to them. So there's eight of them are highly hazardous, and many others have high risks that would need some management or mitigation if they were to be compatible with the goals of IPM. Um, so that achieving some efficacy, compatibility with natural enemies, and also not killing pollinators or bystanders in, in, uh, also. And finally, um, natural enemy risk and uh, restricted entry intervals that I'm going to be talking about have not really been factored into consideration for use of many compounds. And this is a barrier to progress. You will not be able to see the writing on this slide, but if you download the presentation, you can see that the titles of four scientific papers here. All of the papers I'm mentioning today are open source. You can just click on the links to them and find them in the literature. Do a Google search of the article name and find it. Um, organophosphate pesticides, certainly some of them, uh, cause uh, long-term harm to children that were fetuses in their pregnant mothers at the time that they were exposed. This has worked in the USA of a relatively small number of exposures per year by Hispanic farm workers working in fields in the eastern United States and fields in the western United States. The exposure levels were um, thousands of times less 
than uh, women are exposed to um, in fields in West Africa, where I have done a great deal of work, thousands of times less. And yet at the levels of exposure in the United States, there was a 15-point reduction in IQ in children five years after they were born following the exposure of their mothers uh, when they were pregnant. So these are not trivial impacts, but they're difficult to discern. If someone's not doing very well at school or doesn't have very good motor control, they isn't able to hold a pencil, you don't necessarily attribute that to an experience that you may have had years before. So chronic risks are a major factor that we have to consider. And why is this important? These are data from um, wristbands that 35 farmers and farm family members wore in Senegal a few years ago. And we published this in Royal Society Open Science. Um, there were 70 wristbands in total, because 35 people wore them on two occasions of one week. These risk profiles, these curves, show the concentration in each wristband. We found in Senegal the highest levels of pesticide exposure of any measurements that have been made around the world. We also found a larger number of pesticides in these wristbands than have been found elsewhere, and also pesticides that are highly toxic, including the compounds that cause the neurodegenerative um, outcomes that I talked about in the previous slide. So if you look at the middle of the slide, about the 35% point, you'll see chlorpyrifos there, dot, 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 is present in nearly half, in half of the wristbands and that significant concentration. I'll put to you that the Senegalese farmers and farm families were not even aware that chlorpyrifos was marketed and it wasn't labeled for use in the fields in which we carried out these exposure measurements. And so managing and limiting and reducing exposure to high-risk pesticides and highly hazardous pesticides is a priority and something we can all contribute to. Why are exposures in Africa so high? It's because people work diligently in the fields uh, for much of the week to, to, develop, to produce the harvestable yield that they support their livestock and their families with. So in vegetable production in Senegal, men work up to eight hours a day, six days a week, so do women. And children of around age 10 and upwards work in the field for about five hours a day. Babies are also carried in the field by, by women. So we have extreme concerns about high levels of exposure that exceed the one to three hours a day, one or two days a week, what might occur in the United States. And in a situation where protective clothing is not available and fundamental education about pesticide risks is not widely distributed, these exposures are definitely occurring, sadly. And the paper I refer to below, which is also referred to in the, Royal, in the uh, IPM guide published by USID and CIMIT, uh, is open source. And it shows data for 15 um, villages in Africa where you can see for yourself what the pesticide uses and exposures were. One thing we have done, which I'll, at the end of the talk, we'll be going to show you, um, is we've calculated the period after spraying that you would have to wait before it's safe to re-enter the field. We use the Environmental Protection Agency's criteria here, but these are not over-precautionary criteria. Uh, if you enter the field before this number of days has elapsed, uh, you are exposed to a dose of pesticide that has the potential to cause harm to you. If your body weight is lower than it is for someone in the United States, and in Africa that is commonly the case, or if you are very young compared to the assumptions we make in the United States about who is walking the fields and who's working the fields all the day, then those concentrations of pesticide in your body are more harmful. And so here we can see a concentration of pesticide that decays over time. And at some point, you reach the time at which, if you wear protective clothing, which is not available in most of Africa, it would be OK to enter the field. Then a further number of days elapse as you move towards the right until you reach the point where reentry might be OK without PPE. What I want you to do is get, get real about this. If an African family is in the field every day, it is, not it is not a reasonable assumption to make that they could use a pesticide that requires them to delay entering the field for several days. 
it's impossible. If your 10-year-old son is running through the field with a stick, chasing rats or birds away to stop them eating your fruit or your grain every day, then he is exposing himself to large amounts of pesticide deposits on leaves as he's running through the field, unless this interval has been observed. So here's the paper, Measuring Pesticide Ecological and Health Risk in West Africa. There's another paper that we're just preparing to submit to a major journal. Um, you can download this and read that. But our question is, you know, we're not going to be distributing a Royal Society journal article to 30 million farmers. Of course not. We publish in high integrity journals to protect ourselves from um, the types of um, responses that we commonly get to this work when we publish it because um, the messages that we convey are not necessarily welcome to everybody. However, what we've done is we've asked ourselves the question, how do we translate this information into a form that um, an African farmer may be able to make use of this? And here we see a set of pictograms. On the left, you see the alphabetical list of pesticide names, and this was a 45, I believe, compound list for Senegal that uh, were the commonly used pesticides. Many of them had the same active ingredients, but each one of these relates to a specific name. And when we share this with farmers in Senegal, we have a photograph of the label. Then the first um, indicator is an unacceptably high risk to a pesticide applicator. We found up to 100,000 times more than the acceptable daily dose if certain pesticides were used in a backpack sprayer. Why is this? It's because firstly, farmers are brushing themselves against the foliage of quite tall plants as they walk through them. So the exposures are higher than you would have for most backpack applications in the West, where people do not use backpack sprayers for tall and foliar crops. And secondly, very, very highly toxic pesticides are still available in Africa and labeled for use in many countries that are no longer available in the West. And so that's that first indicator. The second indicator is for inhalation toxicity. And this is inhalation for a child stood at the edge of the field 24 hours or later after spraying. Uh, would they receive a toxic insult to their bodies by simply breathing next to the field? Then the next column shows a histogram which shows the number of days that you would need to delay re-entry in order to not receive a dose that can be potentially harmful to you. And you can see in some cases here we've got up to three weeks, which is impossible if you are um, wanting to be in the field every day. The next column shows toxicity to um, aquatic organisms, perhaps fish that you're harvesting in your rice paddy or irrigation system or a pond. Next, it's toxicity to domesticated animals, which would also include wildlife, of course. Next, toxicity to bees, pollinators, which are vital not only just as a source of honey, but actually to pollinate the crops that we rely upon to produce the nutrients that our children require when they're growing up, as well as adults need. And finally, toxicity to natural enemies, which I have some renown in. If you look up my name on Google Scholar, you'll see I've published nearly 100 papers about pesticide toxicity to natural enemies. This is a barrier to IPM. No question about it. But nobody can challenge that assertion. If you use a pesticide and it kills the natural enemies in the field, your pest outbreak following this is worse than it would have been than if you had not used the pesticide. In some cases, a pesticide use is needed, and there are ways to avoid excessive impacts on natural enemies. But if you're using a pesticide and it's toxic to parasitic wasps, lady beetles, um, spiders, other organisms, then you provide opportunities for pests that can attack the crop, and other pests that you were not expecting can appear in the field. So this is information we provided to Senegalese farmers in this form. And we developed this in collaboration with them, and they really enjoyed the work. So although when we present this in our erudite scientific articles, we talk about on the left here a period of research and discovery, um, looking at the local context through a variety of anthropological um, inquiries. We then develop a decision support tool, and you'll see a little drawing there of these pictograms. 
then presented to farmers. The farmers then guide us through, through how they manage their crops. What, at what point are they making decisions about whether or not they would need a pesticide? And what we do is we get them to tell us how they would use this guide in order to assist that decision, and then we re, uh, refine the guide. We develop capable decision makers, and then the outcomes then are that risks are reduced. And one key thing to point out to you is that uh, many people, including some regulatory agencies and many labels in West Africa, carry the assumption that a dry deposit of pesticide, crystals of pesticide on a leaf, are not toxic to people as they walk through the field. And that is a complete fallacy. It's perfectly possible for that pesticide to be absorbed into your skin and absorbed into your body, or if you're eating your lunch in the field, for those crystals to enter your mouth, or if you rub your eye or wipe sweat away from your brow with a contaminated hand or body part, then you are exposing yourself to that compound. So restricting entry, particularly for women and children, is a thing that we've seen with African farmers. Hundreds of them have responded to most. But many also realize there are lower risk pesticides that they can select. And that's what the purpose of this particular educational mechanism is. So a couple of years ago, um, we worked with a group of uh, within village farmer field school facilitators in Senegal and taught them how to explain these pictograms and work them into decision making by farmers. It's a four day course that we run. And by the end of it, these farmers then went and worked out with, with several hundred other farmers to see what would happen. And once a week for 12 weeks, they met for an hour with farmers in their fields and worked them through the idea of when they go to the kiosk, selecting a lower risk pesticide. And in doing that, here's some data that we've recently analyzed. We found that most of the farmers that were trained took actions to reduce risk. Uh, many of them realized they could select low risk pesticides. Um, and finally, uh, the top motivation really is protecting human health and preventing re-entry, particularly for women and children. I won't go through the whole detail of that, and it will be published soon. However, um, you'll note that what I'm not talking about in this presentation is whether or not people are making the decision to use pesticides in the first place. That's really critical because in many cases, pesticides are not necessarily at all. But also, we're in the real world here. We're not in an imaginary world where we're simply saying to a farmer whose field is being ravaged, oh, you should be relying on natural enemies, not going out to find a spray. And there are many fallacies out there. There's much misinformation. We're now advocating pesticide use at all, but if pesticides are going to be selected, what we want to do is minimize those risks that are measurable and known and can be lethal, shorten someone's life, and have an adverse outcome that leads to more pests in the field. So by generating this information, we want to provide a starting point for being more assertive about things that are well known, that we have certainty about, and that we can manage if only we can get this information out there. I'm finishing my talk in a, in a minute or so. Um, here's a recommendation I saw from a southern African country. It's for a widely used pesticide against fall armyworm, MMX in benzoate. And the recommendation was that it should be mixed with a wetting agent, nonolphenol. Um, and so I can ask myself, or you might ask yourself, what is it that Paul and his group and collaborators might provide me with that might assist a decision about whether or not um, MMX in benzoate is compatible with IPM goals and family health goals and environmental goals for a small farmer, smallholder farmer in Africa? Well, um, through the pictograms and other data that we could provide, um, there's a very high level of concern about MMX in benzoate in use conditions in the United States. Um, levels of exposure should not exceed 0 0.0025 milligrams per, kilo, per kilogram of body weight per day. Um, that would probably be a lower expectation in Africa because people are not always as fully healthy as they um, would be in the uh, United States uh, as, as uh, people working on farms necessarily. 
There are neurological and brain function effects, however, that are a deep concern and levels of exposure need to be kept low if it's going to be used at all. There's a, there's a limit of this tiny amount you can see on the slide for food tolerance on corn cobs for people eating the corn. And this pesticide is also highly toxic to aquatic invertebrates, mammals, and bees. And finally, it may accumulate in the environment as well. So in that particular case, the conditions under which MMX in benzoate could be used would certainly require access to protective clothing, which, as I say, is not widely available. Nonolphenol is a hormone analog. It's a female estrogen mimic. It feminizes males that use them. It reduces sperm count. I'm, some of my own research with a student of mine, Scott Heck, was the publication of the year in Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, a major toxicology journal a few years ago, and we showed that fish were feminized and unable to complete their reproductive life cycles when exposed to tiny amounts of nonalphenol. And this material has been banned in the, United, in the United States and European Union for a very long time. So to see this recommended by a government agency for use by farmers in fields who are unaware of its potential chronic health hazards is distressing to me. And this is information I feel we should be getting out to you. So in summary, we started on the left in October with, with knowledge of chemicals that are out in the system and are being talked about in terms of toxicity to fall armyworm. Eight of these are highly hazardous and should not be used. But others have high risk for other to organisms and bystanders and workers in the field that need to be managed. We've discerned that there are 10 to 15 compounds that are lower risk, of which we believe 6 to 10 may be efficacious against fall armyworm. We're hoping to get to the green box as quickly as we can, and that will be a good place to be. But what we want you to understand is until we get there, we've got uncertainties about what to actually um, support in terms of a usage that may not impose hazards on a farm and their family that are unreasonable to expect them to, a, bur a burden that's unreasonable to expect them to bear. One of the thing we have done in collaboration with Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau International is to support them in their development of pest management decision guides. So in Senegal, uh, there's around 50 pesticides that are commonly available in farm kiosks around the country. What uh, CABI has done is to isolate those groups of compounds, in this case, Bt, chlorantraniliprol, and a combination of acetamidrin and slandosahelatrin that have short restricted entry intervals if protective clothing is not properly available to farm workers. Um, you'll notice that the pre-harvest interval for two of these compounds is rather long. And also, I would note to you that the combination of acetamidrin and lambdocyhalotrin is probably useless or of very low efficacy. It may be that Bt and chlorantraniliprol are the only two compounds that are useful. However, we are trying to get this information out to you as quickly as we can. I'm just about to finish now in case the uh, organizers are getting nervous about how long I'm taking. So the three things we're going to do in the next few months, three key elements that you can expect to hear from, and I'm responsible for delivering these. So you can, you know, phone me at 3 o'clock in the morning if I'm not uh, delivering them. Firstly, we're going to provide an applicator training guide that addresses the risks that applicators and pesticide handlers are actually exposed to, um, as well as how to use a sprayer. There's no existing guide out there that, cur that, cur that currently talks about those critical um, aspects of handling a pesticide spray that can result in um, high levels of exposure. And this is a great concern to us. And we're working with an artist in Senegal to produce cartoons and drawings that are going to help in this regard. Secondly, um, I showed you the pictograms and explained that we've perfected this methodology of training trainers. We're going to convert that into a manual, and then in Ethiopia probably, and certainly Malawi, and possibly Ghana, and other countries that you might invite us to, uh, we're going to be training trainers in how to recognize which compounds on a kiosk shelf are less toxic than others in the ways that I explained to you.
And finally, we use a methodology at Oregon State where we actually go out into the field and talk directly to farmers. I know this is shocking to many of you, but we talk directly to farmers and find out how do you make decisions? What are your concerns? So we use this diagnostic approach. It's called an IPMSP, an IPM strategic plan. And what it de delivers is our instructions to scientists, to technical experts on what the farmers require in order to improve their decisions and improve management of the crop. These are very wide ranging. They apply to all aspects of IPM, but in re with respect to pesticides, it's going to tell us a huge amount about how to address vulnerabilities in the system. So thank very much to you for listening today. Uh, Dawn has just appeared on the West Coast here in the United States, and I know some of you are finishing work and uh, about to go home. So thank you so much for listening. But uh, here's uh, three things that we're going to provide that address critical knowledge gaps in the system at the moment. And so if you have access to these, you, any individual in this hall, will be able to contribute positively towards uh, improving uh, the efficacy of pesticides if they are deemed to be appropriate in a particular use case, and also to minimize the likelihood of adverse acute and chronic risk to human health and the environment, all of which we're concerned about, but all of which we tend to talk about rather a lot and not do much about. So what we've worked on for a very long time, uh, I've been working since 1977 on these factors, so I do have a certain amount of experience. Um, we're trying to channel this information into guides that can be helpful to you. And at that point, I'm going to hand over to my esteemed colleagues who are going to talk a little bit more about how we can follow up with this information if you found it useful. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much. That has been fantastic. I feel like I learn so much every time I hear you speak. And I just want to recap a few things with, with Paul's presentation before we go on to the next slide, and that is the serious risk that pesticides pose to everyone, not just to farmers. But, but farmers in particular spend so much more time in their fields and have such a higher level of exposure to these pesticides. Having, having lived there, I can think of all the images I have of children that are uh, leaving their homes and running through fields to go to school back and forth every day and the uh, tremendous amount of exposure that these pesticides um, and dangers that they pose to children. Uh, it's always interesting to know that, uh, that sometimes the use of pesticides can even make things worse. So it was great to hear your presentation, and we're not quite done with you yet, and I encourage everyone to continue to, to stay around because we'll be asking a number of questions, including we'll be going back to our poll questions. But before I do that, I do want to highlight that for those of you who are working with USAID missions, we have developed a mechanism uh, to access some of Paul's expertise. It's a, a buy-in through a PASA, which isn't going to mean much to many of you out there, but it's a mechanism that we have available. If you have any questions about it, uh, you can please contact us at, at the um, uh, email address that's on the screen there, fallarmyworm at usid.gov. But it, it gives us the potential to, to come out and, and do some of the things that Paul's talked about with regard to uh, to uh, training of trainers and pesticide safety and pesticides management. So contact us if you have any more questions on that, uh, predominantly for USAID missions. I know this probably doesn't, the word buy-in probably doesn't mean much to the rest of you. But before we go any further with the other questions, what I'd like to do, Paul, if you don't mind, if we could pull back the poll questions that we had earlier, because I think I found it fascinating the, uh, the responses on many of the poll questions were actually uh, split. And so, Paul, I'd like to ask you the poll questions and have you answer them. And the first one is, I can trust the labels on pesticides, true or false? I have to tell you, I don't see many really great labels in Africa. Um, often the hazard information in the form of pictograms does tell you if a pesticide is highly toxic or not, so that is a help. Um, but only certain labels I have seen provide you with the information you require to calibrate your sprayer and apply the correct amount. And certainly, uh, the levels of toxicity to organisms like pollinators or domestic animals, and also the risk of chronic impact is not commonly uh, on there. So although trustworthiness is, is a, um, a thing to really 
uh, question, isn't it? It's, uh, I think the major issue is that information is commonly limited on labels and that this information we're providing should be used as a supplement to the label in order to make better decisions. So I think... Um, Go ahead, Paul. I, I think that, that split is not unreasonable. Let's move on to the next one so we can sure. get on to the substantive question. Sure. Do pesticides have a role in fall armyworm management? I can't see the results there. Can you tell me what they are? Uh, I can't see the results either, but you can go ahead and, and just answer the question. Uh, um, pesticides do have a role in fall armyworm management. Um, not in every field and every year, and certainly in this transitional period when the uh, crop varieties that are there lack um, resistance. But in some cases where you're inundated early in the season with large numbers of fall armyworm, you can protect your crop with a spray in advance of the field being colonized widely by natural enemies, and particularly if you use a spray that's not toxic to natural enemies, you can get uh, a really good outcome. So yes, they are usable. And then I'm going to skip the next question because I think your whole presentation has uh, okay has, uh, has covered that. But the yeah. question after that is: uh, Is the label a sufficient guide for selecting pesticides and understanding uh, risk? As labels stand at the moment, I'm afraid not. And I have to tell you, in the United States, I run a very large program in the Western United States. And we provide information that even supplements the extensive labels that we have here in order to guide farmers on better selection and use. Our pesticide regulatory mechanism in the United States has a fourth part of um, um, uh, uh, the process of guiding farmers to what's called safe and effective use, although I don't like the word safety very much. And that fourth part is direct education to farmers in their fields and in winter meetings. And so um, the label in and of itself is a guide, but we need further information in order to use pesticides in an IPN context everywhere, not just in Africa. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. It was interesting to see everyone's responses to those questions, and I'm sure that your thoughts about them have changed a bit over the course of this presentation. Uh, we have been collecting your questions uh, throughout Paul's presentation, and so we're going to go through and ask as many of, of them as we can. <clears throat> so let's see. I'm going to uh, jump back to a question that came in fairly early in your presentation, Paul, from Paul Allard. Um, who asked, when you discussed your farmer training related to risk, did you do um, a, an evaluation of training impact two years later? Because time will show if the behavior change really stuck. Thank you very much, Paul. No, we didn't get the opportunity to do that because funding for such things is rarely available, although we'd really love to. Reinforcement is essential, though. We have no expectation that this information will be sustained in the system for a long time, partly because of the counter information that's provided by those forces in our society that are less interested in the good outcomes that we are all seeking. In uh, Africa, if you look at farmer field school um, outcomes, there is a decay period with a half-life of about one and a half to two years. So four years after training, farmers commonly, unless there's been a reinforcement or they're not sustaining themselves through some continuing social process, um, do lack some of the skills that were developed when they were doing the farmer field schools. So if we're to do this, we need posters, we need campaigns, we need YouTube videos, we need that information to get out there widely and to be reinforced and constantly supported. And this is what we find in our system in the States where we have very similar issues and we need to constantly um, repeat and reinforce and support this information because there's other information out there, some of it well-meaning, but still, if it's not scientifically based and doesn't address the uncertainties that need to be understood, it's unhelpful. And so you get a dilution of the impact of the contribution that you've made. So it's very important that we sustain this and build it over time. Thank you for your question. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, another interesting question from Paul Allerts came in. Uh, he said, 
we really should start from the premises that small farm or smallholder farmers have no access to or are not willing to use protective clothing. It may be too hot or humid, or they just don't have access. How does yeah. this affect your recommendations? It has a profound effect on our recommendations because Paul's describing the real world. Pesticide labels um, tend to assume what's called good agricultural practice in Africa just as much as they do here. They're often based on assumptions of Western levels of exposure, not African levels of exposure. And the assumptions about body weights of those that are exposed and the health profiles and cofactors of those that are exposed do not reflect anywhere in Africa other than possibly South Africa, which uh, may well have more sophisticated mechanisms, do not reflect true exposures and true vulnerabilities. There is no label in the world, as far as I'm aware, talking to the global expert on PPE, personal protective equipment, a couple of weeks ago, that reflects actually the exposures that occur when backpack sprayers are in use. And this is something we want to work on and uh, develop a research stream about, and there are other people doing, making efforts here. And just as a final thing, that there is a group in the world that's trying to contribute information in a positive way to inform farmers. And in India, for example, the country of India, they're screening 160 commonly available clothing fabrics to find out those that are most uh, restrictive for pesticide access. But as a general rule, my argument is, and I've not found a farmer yet who's ever disagreed with this, that if a, if a pesticide to be used safely requires you to have personal protective equipment that's not available to you, you should not use it. And that's easier for me to say than actually achieve. But there are some pesticides out there that have limited toxicity or no toxicity, BT being one of them. Overusing that would be bad. But why is this not registered in a widespread way in Africa at the moment? And why is it not being used more than it otherwise would be? And there are other botanically derived pesticides that have been through proper regulatory mechanisms that also seem to show promise, like azadirectin or neem, and uh, also a chemical called spinosad, which is based on, on fungal organisms. So there are a series of pesticides, including some synthetic, that have less of a requirement for PPE. But it is a concern of all of us that we're, um, uh, the bar, you know, that, that um, if EPA's methodologies were to be used in Africa, many, many pesticides would no longer be sold in the African marketplace. It's a fallacy, and it is false, to claim that if a chemical is registered in the state, it is therefore appropriate in and of itself a, a priori to use in Africa. If we use our methods in many African countries, many compounds would not be registered there. And I cannot repeat that or emphasize it more. So anyway, thank you, Paul, for your question. Are there any other Pauls out there? This seems to be the Paul um, <laughs> kind of AgriLink. Well, I, at the moment, I'm going to switch to a John. Um, oh, so thank no. you, Paul, for that. But uh, John Bowman um, asked, and related to PPE, of the six to 10 efficacious or low-risk pesticides that you mentioned, are there any that have a re-entry period of about one day without personal protective equipment? All of them would have that. Uh, and um, any, anything that comes out of our shop here in terms of the final list that seems to be appropriate, I will personally <laughs> make sure that we're not requiring an unreasonable restricted entry. It doesn't mean you should not be cautious, absolutely not. And here's one other reason why you, shouldn't, you need to be cautious, even with a chemical that has a low restricted entry interval. If you have not had training in how to open a bottle, how to avoid accidentally putting your thumb on that gooey deposit that's in the, in the lid of the bottle, if you've not had training in how to pressurize the sprayer and avoid contaminating yourself, if you do not understand the small amount of pesticide that can achieve efficacy and that you need to walk at a constant rate and put a low concentration field of pesticide over the whole crop rather than standing by an infested plant and like painting it with the lance. If those things are not part of your knowledge base and the concepts are not clear to you, then you can be exposed hundreds of times more than is implied by the label or even the restricted entry interval that I've just provided you with. 
So please don't forget that if a pesticide is applied at a higher rate than was intended, the restricted entry interval would go up. And one thing we're going to try and do is provide guidance on that, because with some pesticides, you can gradually increase exposure and not necessarily suffer a severe health outcome, but there's a threshold level where severe health outcomes can occur in some cases. And so we need to be very, very cautious about this and constantly question the role of pesticides in IPM against fall armyworm fundamentally. However, if the informal marketplace and the way pesticides get distributed in villages and someone sees a farmer who's applied something toxic, he uh, was nauseous after spraying and his kid got sick and his goat died. However, the field was protected. That's an incredibly powerful driver for other people to do the same. And so in recognizing that, what we want to do is reinforce all of the messages and what we're providing for you, including getting the concentration of the tank right and not over applying the chemical. So anyway. I know this is complicated for everybody, but I hope it makes sense. And all of this, really, we have certainty about. This isn't a kind of advocacy argument. Yeah, go ahead. So, so Paul, just uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. And so in the nature of trying to get through a number of these great questions, uh, we're going to pull you in to be a little bit more uh, concise, I think, on some of these. Julie's got a couple okay. more questions for you here. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, let's see. Uh, two related questions. Dumasani Kutiwayo asks, do we have any efficacious botanicals against fall armyworm? And then Jay Camacho asked, um, has there been any research done on organic methods for pesticides or pest controls against fall armyworm? Um, so some of the pesticides I've mentioned to you already do have organic um, formulations. Um, but some of them also, uh, like uh, spinosad and possibly Bt, have formulations that aren't strictly speaking organic. But yes, that is um, that's an interesting point. And um, I think what we might do is make a note on the information we send to you about labels that are organic. Organic provides no guarantee at all about protection for human health, by the way. You still have to look at the label, and very toxic materials are used in organic systems. So uh, again, a common fallacy there, but none of us are here to reinforce that fallacy, I'm sure. Um, what was the other question, the first part? Uh, it was about botanicals. Yeah, if but remind available. me what about them. Are there efficacy? Uh, are there any, yeah, just any efficacious? Oh, oh yeah, okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, well, I mean, um, neem or atazaractin is, is a botanical. And that's been through a full regulatory process, and it's in a formulation that has a shelf life that you can rely upon, and, you, and it's a dose rate that we know. Um, reputationally, you know, there are some botanicals out there that we've heard about that may have some good efficacy. Um, there's one that's used in Senegal that's a blistering agent and causes severe dermal rashes and blistering if you're exposed to them. And there's another one I heard about, which I'm not going to name here which is a profound systemic poison in humans. And so um, we do have to be cautious if materials have not been through a proper regulatory process about what we say about them. However, I think a group of us have a strong belief that there's certain botanicals, some of which might be locally formulated, that have a lot of potential. And we just don't know enough at the moment uh, in order to uh, build the knowledge base for which ones show greatest promise. So uh, thank you for the question. I'll try to be shorter, but that's my answer. Thank you, Paul. Um, another question came in from Marhada Ailita. If we have short-term programs in training, coaching, and support, such as the Farmer to Farmer program, where would you recommend such assignments focus? Given the serious health concerns, should they focus on pesticide training, despite the fact that um, in IPM, pesticides are the last resort? Or should they focus on practices of first resort, such as management, et cetera? Uh, well, my answer to that is both, I'm afraid. And you can have the conversation about pesticides in, for example, a conversation about natural enemies and biological control. Uh, so synthetic pyrethroids, for example, are profoundly toxic to spiders and um, some parasitic wasps and other natural enemies. And they stop natural enemies feeding for a period. That's other research that I did. And so um, 
it's very important to talk about the two at the same time. And if you develop a method of discussion where you're not treating them as separate silos of information, but you're thinking about crop management as a whole as your guide. How are you managing the crop? How are you making decisions? When might you have to make a decision about the pesticide? How do you know if the natural enemies are abundant enough to be cautious and hold back from the pesticide? I think you'll find you can just free up your thinking and have conversations that include both. That's my suggestion. This is Regina Eddy. This is Regina Eddy, the Fall Army Worm Coordinator um, here in Washington supporting the webinar. I want to build on Paul's excellent comments, and, and by the way, Paul, extremely useful presentation. Um, there's a lot of very good information there that we hope people can download and use some of the links and graphs. But building on Marjada's um, uh, insightful question, um, Paul, during his presentation, framed a challenge that's very critical, I think, for all of us, which is how can science be translated into actionable information that does lead to behavior change? And uh, that's really what the spirit of that question is about. And I just wanted to underscore that through our partnership at USAID with Oregon State University and specifically Paul Jebson, we will be providing support exactly in that space. So Paul is developing, as he noted, three training guides that will help at the village and community level animate important conversations to support farmers in the decisions they need to make in their farms. And um, what he's proposing is this broad integrated pest management framework, which we understand requires some experience applying these questions. And so through the pictograms, through the um, uh, activities that he has developed with others that will be captured in these training guides, we hope to provide support and information on exactly how to focus that conversation. And we also will be able to allow experts from Oregon State University and others who Paul Jebson um, aggregates to visit a country, provided you've got some funds, to actually lead some of those trainings when you find that uh, imperative. So um, I just want to really underscore that's a very critical question. We are trying to work in partnership with our field actors um, and with the excellent science and research experts in the US and globally to really support that exact process. Thank you, Regina. Um, and for all of you on the webinar, we have pulled up some of our ending polls. We still have a few more minutes for questions, but in the meantime, uh, we would love to know a little bit more um, about whether you can apply this to your work and some of what you learned and would like addressed in future webinars. This will help us plan for our future webinar series. Um, all right, Paul, a question came in uh, fairly early on from Asa Balayara, who is from Senegal and said that one of the problems is, in general, our farmers cannot read. So they do not know yes. the level of toxicity in their product. What would you recommend for yes. farmers who can't read? There are some color codes and um, indicators on pesticide labels in Senegal uh, that um, don't require um, uh, reading literacy. Although the labels are in French, they're not in all of the uh, local languages. Um, the pictograms were developed with farmers so they could go and talk to their neighbors and discuss different pesticides using the pictograms. And we explained what lay behind each one, by the way, so they understood what they indicated. And we found uh, farmers, whether or not they had the ability to, to read, uh, were incredibly articulate in explaining these and weighing up the pros and cons of different approaches. And so, um, we found that pictorial method to be quite effective. And part of the International Code of Conduct for Pesticide Management is that um, there would be some level of kind of pictogram or color coding or uh, other um, indicators on labels that don't require, require you to know the language of the, on the label or even to be able to read it in order to get some uh, basic indication of toxicity. But you are describing a problem, and uh, you know fundamentally, I often ask myself why certain pesticides are even available in some places when 
Um, you require so much knowledge uh, that some of it written on the label in order to use them in an efficacious way without undue risks. And so, um, you know, that's a dilemma I've struggled with for a very long time. But the pictograms that we're going to provide you with can be used as a supplement to the label and don't require reading. So that's the best I can suggest, I'm afraid, and we hope for better over time. Um, great. Thank you, Paul. All right, we're going to squeeze in one last question before we wrap up. And this one is from uh, Yena Belayne, who said, um, can you share a few words on your experience in access to low-risk and affordable pesticides in Senegal or, in, or perhaps other countries in Africa? What are you finding is available to people at the village level? Um, thanks, Yeni. Um, we certainly found in every kiosk that we went to, and I've been to about 40 kiosks in that work, but uh, there was, um, or I, we're, there have been 40 kiosks visited. I didn't go to all of them. But um, there, there are always available compounds that are less toxic and compounds that are more toxic. It's somewhat distressing to see low toxicity materials uh, in limited availability. There's one particular reason for this is that some of the lower toxic materials, you really have to apply them very well for them to achieve the effect on the pest that you can achieve easily with some of the materials that are highly toxic. Even if you apply some of the highly toxic materials very badly, um, they are so toxic and so persistent that you're going to get some level of efficacy. So the reputation of some of the less toxic compounds is not as good as it should be in a system where good application practices are followed. And this is a tragedy, really. And so in some cases, the pesticide industry itself bemoans the fact <clears throat> that there's reinforcement of the use of some of the more toxic materials because of this phenomenon. It tells you a lot about the suitability of pesticides for use anywhere, but particularly in, in some parts of Africa where access to extension education may be limited. But um, I always we found some materials and you can always in Senegal for example find bio bits and in the in um, the, the one of the uh, BTs and uh, some of the less toxic uh, pesticides synthetic pyrethroids some of them have low concentration formulations and can be efficacious against some pests not fall armyworm so it is possible what you need what really is needed is a local guide in each place and then farmers saying well we want some of the less toxic stuff and then the merchants acquire those pesticides and you kind of reinforce the local market. And it needs a process like that to really make it work in the long term. Okay, Paul, I want to thank you very much for taking the time today to, uh, to be with us. For many of you, you probably don't know, Paul was, uh, had to start speaking at close to 6 a.m. his time, and we're grateful that uh, someone with his level of expertise and experience would be available on a webinar like this. I hope it's been informative for all of us to walk away with a much better understanding of the, the dangers and the toxicities of pesticides. In so many countries, it seemed like pesticides were the easy political ex expedient to, to um, sh demonstrate to farmers that the governments could do things. But we're finding out now that really uh, that, that was probably, probably not the best choice in many cases. Throughout the series, we have talked about our, the importance of an integrated pest management approach. And we've, uh, in our first webinar, went through a whole list of tools that are available out there, technologies that, that uh, are effective in, in addressing and dealing with fall armyworm. We've highlighted a number of tools, and we're working hard with colleagues around the world to provide you with the best tools available to address the fall armyworm. We want to thank you for spending these last three weeks with us. If you've missed any of our podcasts, we uh, any of our webinars, we encourage you to go back and download the webinar. It's available for your use. The PowerPoint presentations are available. There's a lot of great information in there. There are resources and there are links. Uh, we're available here to help you in any way that we can, and we'll continue to work to put out these uh, tools that are helpful to help you practically address uh, finding ways to manage to fall armyworm. And with that, I want to thank everybody for taking the time and uh, wish you well. Thank you all. We'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, thanks to Paul, our USAID team here, uh, the AgriLinks team for hosting the webinar, and most importantly to you, our attendees. We'll see thank you. you.